Um, it strikes me having met uh, Jim for about 10 minutes uh, before, um, before this that my introduction might be a little too reverent. Uh, but so let me just say Jim Shepard has something of the icky guy about him. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, it's my pleasure. To, that was a funnier joke before that story came to the last page. You know? <laughs> um, it's my pleasure to introduce Jim Shepard tonight, who, whose work I sadly wasn't aware of before a few weeks ago. Um, uh, and I now realize what a gaping hole in my literary knowledge and indeed my life that is. Um, aesthetically and thematically, Jim's fiction represents a direction in contemporary American letters that I hope more people pursue and I would love to see in the pages of more literary journals. Um, so short story workshop participants take note. Um, the New York, New York Times Review of Books has called him a master of the quote, small tricky genre, end quote, of the historical short story. <laughs> um, he navigates between realist, psychological, suburban uh, short stories and uh, quirky, chance-taking, best-if-kept-brief experimental fiction, um, sort of doing both and neither at once. He creates new textures in American fiction by heavily researching his works. In an interview with the Sycamore Review, he confessed to spending seven years researching for a novel, which eventually turned into a 12-page short story. <laughs> That's, that's rough. <laughs> um, these are not works of historical nonfiction, however. Instead, he admits that he attempts to be, quote, A, as faithful to, to the truth as I can be, and B, to remember that the truth, as historians remind us, can be a malleable thing, end quote. This dexterity with historical detail gives him a wide range of subject matters from Nazis to horror movies to aircrafts to explorers. Jim's latest collection of short stories, You Think That's Bad, is concerned with, uh, according to Book Slut, I'm just so happy to get to say that on camera, uh, quote, non-religious historical terminations, end quote. His works are populated with, according to the LA Times, quote, husbands, fathers, co-workers, lost among the surfaces of the world, end quote. For these lost characters, emotional bonds as world-continuing messes are, are uh, abundant. There is something safer, more manageable, if you will, about the cold of the grave than the sprawl and error of the human relationship. This privileging of the Apollonian over the Dionysian seems to beckon his characters towards the gullet of Thanatos and the most perfect order of all, a total cessation. But though his characters may long for stillness and security, Jim's work is frenetic, ranging from the Netherlands' attempt to deal with rising ocean levels, to the special effects artist for Godzilla, to the plight of a 1930s travel writer struck down with malaria while researching a Shia sect who employed targeting killings as a political tool, uh, which is where we get the word assassin. His resume is equally lively. His work has been published in McSweeney's, the Atlantic Monthly, Esquire, Harper's, The New Yorker, The Paris Review, Plowshares, Triquarterly, and Playboy. His short story collection, Like You'd Understand Anyway, won the Story Prize in 2008 and was nominated for a National Book Award in 2007. The novel Project X won the 2005 Massachusetts Book Award. Along with writing novels and short stories, he has also drafted two screenplays um, and uh, is working on a uh, movie adaptation of Project X. He currently teaches creative writing and film at Williams College um, and is also on the editorial board of The Common. Uh, and as Daniel Handler at the New York Times said, quote, Shepard is an impressive writer, but I wasn't impressed until I finished the book. I was too busy being enthralled, end quote. I, for one, am looking forward to spending the next 30 minutes in his thrall. Please join me in welcoming Jim Shepard. Thank you, Matthew. That was very sweet and more than people wanted to know, probably. <laughs> um, many years ago, at the Breadloaf Writers Conference, I announced I was going to take a little less time than was officially allotted me, and the poet Donald Justice was so grateful he was moved to tears. <laughs> so I'm going to do that again. I'm going to take a little less time than I'm supposed to. And then we'll have more time for a Q&A. <clears throat> um, I'm going to read two short shorts. Uh, one old, one brand new. And the first one is called Proto-Scorpions of the Silurian. 
It's a crappy, rainy morning in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and I'm home from seventh grade with a sore throat, and my parents and brother are fighting, and I'm trying every so often to stay out of it. Jonathan Winters is on Merv Griffin doing his improv thing with a stick. My father's beside himself because he thinks my mother threw out the Newsweek he's been saving to show my brother. It had war casualties on the cover. You couldn't find your ass with both hands and a banjo, he tells my mother, though she's not looking. Go take a shit for yourself, she tells him on her way through to the living room. He slams drawers in the kitchen. When he gets like this, he stops seeing what's in them. We have to double check everywhere he's looked to find anything. All of this is probably going to make my brother go off, and we all know it, but none of us can stop. My brother was institutionalized at 16 and released eight months later. It was at Yale New Haven, a teaching hospital, and they either didn't have much of an idea of what to do with him or they were totally at a loss, depending on who you talk to. God forbid we should go somewhere, my mother says from the living room. She's smoking and keeping to herself. What we need to do instead is show each other magazines. Maybe you should go somewhere, my father tells her. My brother and I are playing 500 rummy. He's kicking my ass. For a while, I was kicking his. He's quiet like he's trying to concentrate. He hates when my father goes out of his way to do something for him. He pats his hair, which is falling out because of the medication, the way you check your pockets for something before you leave the house. His eyes are getting scarier, distracted and unfocused. He takes a break to make a tuna sandwich. White bread, no mayonnaise. He forks it out of the can and tries to spread it around. The tuna doesn't cooperate. He clears his throat a lot. My mother's still talking to herself. I try a joke. My brother gets that look you get when bile backs up. He's at this point 18 or 19 and has, as he puts it, his whole fucking life ahead of him. I ask my father why he's home from work today. What are you, a cop, he goes. I'm flipping my cards and debating whether to look at my brother's cards while he makes his sandwich. I'm also poking through a book I took out from the library. It has a giant scorpion on the cover, and you have to take something out and do a report every week. It takes forever to find something that's even halfway interesting. I get good grades, which is what I do instead of talking to people. My parents think I'm going to college. <laughs> My father says when people ask that it's the one thing this family hasn't fucked up. <laughs> Pre-Arcturus Gigas, it says, was over one meter long. I try pronouncing the name under my breath. You're all right, my brother says, eyeing me. That turns out to be a scorpion three feet long. There's a life-size picture of the fossil's pedipalps, movable things near the mouth that help shovel the prey in, next to a photo of ones from the largest scorpions today. It's like hunting knives next to fingernail parings. My father starts rooting through the garbage under the sink, swearing. My mother calls it saying a rosary. <laughs> Don't go through the garbage, she tells him. It's not in the garbage. Nobody's watching the TV in the den. Scorpions apparently went nuts during the Carboniferous period, which was way before the dinosaurs, according to what the book calls the fossil record. But our science teacher says the fossil record's a joke, that it's like saying we can figure out who lived in the U.S. by going through 12 dumpsters. Sitting there at the table, waiting, I come across these things from before the Carboniferous that weren't even scorpions proto-scorpions. They have like no eyes, no claws. Who knows? They may just be lousy fossils. <laughs> My father starts shaking the plastic garbage can upside down into the sink. We can smell it from where we are. I have no idea what you're doing, my brother tells him. My mother says he better not be making a mess. There, you son of a bitch, my father goes, pulling out the magazine. What do you want from me, my brother says, when my father holds it up. A dance? 
After a minute, my father starts cleaning everything up, dropping stuff back into the can's liner. I start winning at rummy. Fucking Cincinnati kid, my brother goes, watching me. The kid with all the answers, I tell him. You can see him wondering how I meant that and then figuring it's not worth finding out. Here's the article I was talking about, my father tells him. There's a muffin wrapper stuck to it. Very nice, my brother goes. He's rearranging the suits in his hand. He's starting to look worse. He doesn't do almost anything but work out. And his arms, when he flexes them, rip the t-shirt sleeves. I'm out, I tell him again, and fan the cards between us. I catch him with another big hand. He sits there with his eyes on me, setting one molar on another. While he does the math, I page around some more in the book. There's a drawing of something that looks like a shingle with some antenna. It looks like I'm showing off, beating him while reading a book. But it's somewhere to put my eyes, so I can't bring myself to shut it. You playing cards or reading, my father wants to know. He can see my brother's face. The library, my mother calls from the other room. It's the only place anybody in this family goes. Where are we going to go? It's a fucking downpour, my brother tells her. She doesn't answer. My father wipes his sponge around the rim of the sink, finishing the cleanup. I'm given a dream hand, a run and a half, right off his deal. And the card I need after that is the first one he discards. I think about not saying anything. Then I go ahead. I'm out again, I tell him, putting my cards down to show him. He pulls his hands back to his lap and sits there. Then he turns the whole table over. At its highest point, the whole thing's up over my head. A few minutes after it hits, the neighbor across the street calls to see if everything's all right. Later, when everything's quiet, I'm still in the kitchen. There's a divot in the linoleum where the table edge came down. I'm in the corner with my back to the cabinets. My brother's in his room. My mother's in hers. My father hurt his back, wrestling my brother up the stairs. He's got the heating pad on it. One end of the pad's tucked into his belt, so it looks like he's plugged into the wall. There's tuna in my sock. My throat's still sore. There's not enough self-pity to go around. Is he your brother or not, my father's asking me. Yeah, I tell him. So you want to help him, he wants to know. Yeah, I tell him, tearing up. Well, then why don't you help him, he wants to know. Because there's what we want and what we do. I'd figured out, even then. You want to help him, he asks me again. Not really, I tell him, sitting there. Not really, I tell myself, now. So that's one short short. Thank you. See, if you read two short shorts, you actually get two tepid things of applause. So it's really worth it. <laughs> this is a second one. Um, this is brand new, and it's called Cretan Love Song. And that's A-N, not I-N. Cretan Love Song. Whenever you read a story like that, I have a poet friend, uh, Ed Hirsch, he says he always tries to read at least one poem that makes people want to come up and hug him afterwards. <laughs> and he, he went to a reading of mine, and afterwards he goes, you know, you seem to do the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is called Cretan Love Song. Imagine you're a part of the Minoan civilization, just hanging out with your feet, painted face, down by the water's edge on the north shore of Crete, circa 1600 B.C., Biting flies knit the breeze around your head. Wavelets slap discreetly ashore. When the volcanic island of Thera detonates 70 miles to the north, the concussion, even where you're standing, knocks passing waterfowl out of the air. Oxen are jolted to their knees. <coughs> Back where Thera used to be, 
More than 35 cubic miles of the equivalent of dense rock have been blown out of the water and up into the troposphere. That's all of Manhattan and the bedrock beneath it concussing upward 30,000 feet. It's as if something has convulsed the horizon and churned the bowl of the sky above. What you're looking at, no one in recorded history has ever seen before or since. Long before the blast column has reached the upper atmosphere, the shock wave coalesces in a grim line that radiates from the outer edge of your field of vision all the way to your little inlet. The oxen, still on their knees, low in terror and struggle to regain their footing. Your boy, your primary responsibility, seems to have slipped from your grasp. Everyone just gapes while the surge flashes across the last of the distance, and when it hits, you're knocked flat like the oxen. The palms above and around you stripped of their leaves in a roaring turmoil of wind and sand. The woman beside you is on her hands and knees. The infant she'd been holding is face down and crying nearby at the end of a swaddling cloth that apparently unspooled in the impact. One oxen is up and is lumbering inland. Off the beach, a dark blue band like a furrow races back out to sea. Your boy calls to you through air alive with grit and glittering in the sun. He has only one eye open, which may make the view a little less painful. Once the undersea furrow finally aligns with the horizon, it holds steady for a moment. Your boy is still calling. The infant is still crying. Then the horizon line darkens still more and widens. All of this accompanied by a continuous rolling thunder that seems to emanate from somewhere beyond the curve of the earth. Another oxen has gotten to its feet and bowled past its handler in panic. It's only when you look to the east and west that you realize that the band is widening because it's rising. It's a wave of a size without precedent. At 60 miles away, it already appears an inch tall. Its upper edge is frayed and filigreed in white. Its reverberations are already oscillating through your hands and feet. You have time to run, but unless you're able to cover half the island in the next four minutes, you might as well stay where you are. Your boy finds you, since you've done so little to find him. He asks what's happening. He asks what you're going to do. He asks as if the very extent of your love and responsibility might carry with it sufficient power to avert even something like this. He reminds you that you have to run, and you understand him to mean that though you won't reach safety, you could reach your home, his mother, and your wife. You can, in the interval you have left, make clear with just a moment's embrace and the time to hold her face still and engage her eyes that despite your lassitude and arrogance and petulance and selfishness and pettiness, she's granted you a gift for which you've never adequately expressed your joy. She's buoyed you and nurtured you and weathered your despotism and continued to envision what you still might have become rather than what you are. She's put wings to your feet for the entirety of your life together and with them you run. Your boy mostly keeps pace, clutching at your arm when you begin to pull away. He's the one who got you moving, but is now receding, and you reach back your hand at his cry. The wave behind you is an all-enveloping sonic domain. The road before you is one you've traversed a thousand times. The woman waiting in the courtyard is your best chance to accomplish one more panegyric before the world upheaves and confirms that whatever other self-renovations you may have had planned, your time is gone. <laughs>